Thank you. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce Helga Novotny, who is my absolute role model. I, I want to be like her, and you should all be. <laughs> because she's an example of both individual agency and a strong promoter of, of beneficial collective agency. Um, she received a doctorate at uh, jurisprudence at the tender age of 22, and then faced opposition to be hired, right, in the Austrian system as a woman. But she managed, uh, and so she became assistant professor at the Department of Criminology in Vienna, but then she went uh, to do her doctorate degree in sociology at Columbia University and was working with uh, Paul Lazarsfeld and Robert Merton. And then she returned uh, to Vienna in Institute for Advanced Studies and continued her uh, extraordinarily, sci extraordinary scientific career. She worked on very cool topics from scientific controversies, social time, self-organization in science, gender relations in science, and in general uh, relationship between science and technology and a sociology of science. And that uh, interest in sociology of science was also exhibited practically because she was leading numerous scientific boards, policy-related committees, scientific organizations. She was one of the founding members of the ERC, uh, European Research Council, and its president for four years. And uh, her contributions are well summarized by um, a British Academy that uh, also gave her one of the many prizes and said it's for her contribution to founding and shaping of the ERC and positively influencing the shape of research funding and research policy in Europe. So thank you very much. <laughs> And uh, also, luckily for us at the Complexity Science Hub, she's a founding member um, uh, uh, of the Complexity Science Hub Vienna and chair of its science advisory and strategic advisory board. And even better, she's now working with us scientifically uh, on the project that she will also present now, uh, which is a fresh set of studies on collective agency in local sustainability initiatives. And she collaborates with us at the Hub, and I'm super excited about the next few years. And thank you for being with us here. Thank you. Thank you. I I am, oh, I am already connected. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. When Mirta approached me to speak today here on collective agency, I said I know nothing about collective agency. <laughs> but Mirta is very persuasive, as you found out, and she's very persistent. So I thought I will speak to you on three different sides, three different perspectives about collective agency. And I want to start with <clears throat> the topic that we heard already uh, this morning. You know, what is it? We cannot define it. Um, what could it be? And so on. I will then move on to an empirical project in which I'm now engaged with the Complexity Science Hub and the Institut des Études Avancées in Paris. And then I will speak a little bit about my experience with the ESC. So let's start <clears throat> with what is collective agency for. I cannot define it, but <clears throat> I thought maybe it's somewhere between collective intelligence and collective action. You know, there's, it's a vast span <clears throat> of possibilities. We have no idea what collective intelligence is because we don't even know what intelligence is. We have natural, artificial, collective intelligence. Nobody knows what it is. But uh, we have collective action, because after all, what we do, what we see, is the result of people working together one way or the other, also working against each other, which also has interesting effects. So I thought maybe <clears throat> if um, I want to follow the question, give an answer, what is it for? Now, <clears throat> what is it for? We <clears throat> it's a potential. And the potential, in my view, is perhaps best captured by focusing on a problem. And the problem is there to be solved. There are many other ways of conceptualizing it, but I find it useful to think of problems. There are different kinds of problems. There are mathematical problems, very exciting, and we have some mathematicians here, so you know how exciting it can be and how important it is. And mathematicians are known for working in a very individual way. Nevertheless, um, you know all these stories about famous mathematicians 
traveling around the world, and then they find another group of three mathematicians with whom they can discuss. So after all, work is collective as well. And we know this also about great <coughs> minds like Albert Einstein. There's now huge literature on the way how Albert Einstein was connected and interacting with other people in the formation of his scientific work. So even if we look at individuals, there's always a collective behind it. So there are these kind of technical, scientific problems that you are all engaged in. Then there are problems <clears throat> that have to do with the big topics of the world, sustainability, climate change, etc. So these are the mega problems that are also there. And then there are many problems in between. I mean, from starting from daily life, the kind of obstacles you have to overcome, traffic problems, etc. So the world is full of problems. And we are there in order to solve them. And we can only solve them if we find some way of working together. And you can call it coordination. You can call it collaboration. <laughs> You can call it joining efforts. There are many different forms of organizing how we work together. And <clears throat> therefore, um, I find it useful to say, you know, what is the kind of problem that is to be solved? And I want to emphasize the second point here. The problem is not a natural entity. A problem needs to be recognized. Otherwise, without awareness, there is no problem. And I just want to give you two historical examples. Slavery. For much of humankind, slavery was not a problem. It was taken for granted. You know, you are part of, you know, starting with the Romans, you conquer the world around you. And you win the war, and you bring the prisoners, and you put them as slaves into your household. And so it went on and on, until this has to do with the European Enlightenment and, and other movements. People started to realize, well, we have a problem. You know, we are talking about equality of people, and yet you know, we treat some people as slaves, as inferior human beings. So this is the kind of awareness that is needed. And also, very recently, climate change. You know, if you go back in, uh, it's not so long, very much before the 1970s, if you spoke about climate change, of course you had people like Arrhenius in Sweden you know, and, and others who were interested in the kind of climate changes in previous times. But this was a rather small academic community doing their academic work. And all of a sudden, you know, awareness started to arise. We have a problem. So I leave it here with these two historical examples uh, to, to make the point that a problem needs awareness. Now, <clears throat> How does awareness arise? That's another uh, question that I cannot go into. But once you are aware there is a problem, you have to define it somehow. You have to take ownership of the problem. Somebody has to feel responsible for trying to solve the problem. Because without this idea you know, of owning a problem, you do nothing about it, and the problem just disappears to be a problem, because it's has nothing to do with you. So it's not your problem, maybe someone else's, but for you it's not a problem. And so the problem disappears or is shifted somewhere else. So this kind of <clears throat> who defines it, who frames it, framing is a way of saying, you know, what are the particular dimensions of the problem? How and why do we see it as a problem? Now, with slavery, we agree, you know, we, want, we believe in equality of human beings, in dignity of human beings, but this is the kind of framing you need. Why are we caring about climate change? Again, you need a particular framing. And you see how difficult it is today to convince others to see climate change is a real problem, and it's an urgent problem to be solved. And others say, well, you know, 
has happened before. There was always climate change. It's none of, of our problem. So the framing is important and to take ownership of it. You must feel it is my responsibility to do something about it. And then, of course, there is the dynamics. We know that certain problems emerge, <clears throat> other problems disappear, that were problems in history that we no longer, luckily or not, consider problem and, and so on. So <clears throat> let me move on <clears throat> to the question of agency, which I want to address again from another perspective. If there is agency, who is an agent? Agency is an abstract noun. and We can discuss what an abstract noun means. But in the end, you want to know who are the people, who are the institutions that do something about it. And <clears throat> here, I want to give you another historic example, because I think you know, the history of humankind has so much to teach us, and we are such bad learners. It's not that history repeats itself. It's not lessons that you can take like from a bookshelf. But nevertheless, if you're interested to look back in history, it is very enriching. And this is an excellent book <clears throat> that was written in, uh, in, in 1980 by an American historian, Elizabeth Eisenstein. And <clears throat> the title of the book is The Printing Press as an Agent of Change. And <clears throat> of course, the printing press is a technology. And very often, we think you know, technologies are agents of change. We sort of <clears throat> take them to be agents, and technology acts. I mean, you set up a barrier, <clears throat> uh, and you cannot go through it. So this is the most simple way of how technology works. And therefore, it has some kind of agency. And of course, then there's all the discussion about AI and agency that, again, I will not <laughs> go into here. But <clears throat> so who is an actual agent? And with this title, <clears throat> she, it's, it's, a, it's a title to lead us <clears throat> down a road that in the book she says is not the right title. Uh, because she shows it's not the technology per se. After all, you know, the Chinese had already uh, invented printing way, way back in the 9th century. The Koreans in the 12th and 13th century had movable wood types. And yet it was left to Gutenberg in the 16th century from then on to turn this into a technology that would conquer the entire world. So what was happening? And <clears throat> it is you know, this kind of confluence that makes history. You needed agents that were printers. But you know, Gutenberg was one person, so others had to learn. Printing shops had to be set up. You had to have young people willing to go into this business. A business needs financing. So where did the money come from to finance printing shops? Why did those people invest money into printing and printing shops? Then you needed paper. You needed lots of paper. Where did the paper come from? And so she shows how this, you know, the, the, the material uh, necessities to make printing a technology for which we take for granted was done by involving people <clears throat> with different motivations, with different interests. Some wanted to make money. Others thought this, this is great now because my ideas will be spread. And the particular characteristic <clears throat> of this technology, of course, has to do with communication. The printing press allowed ideas to be put on paper and to distribute and diffuse them in those days in the most rapid way that you can think of. It was unprecedented um, <clears throat> to address 
by what you wrote here, and you knew you had 1,000 copies or 6,000 copies that would be read by 6,000 people. And they would talk to other people about what they had read who could not yet read. So you also created a reading public eventually. And all this contributed <coughs> to what we now look at the printing press as an agent of change. So the agent of change is a metaphor. The technology <coughs> stands in for something where when we look a bit deeper, we see all the people that were involved, the institutions that had to be uh, created, uh, the people that were eager to get something, you know, the bias of book. Book was a very precious thing. So why did people want to read? First, they wanted to read the Bible. And it had an enormous impact on uh, religion in Europe because it helped the Protestant movement to gain traction because people all of a sudden no longer depended on the Catholic priest to tell them what was in the Bible, but they could read the Bible for themselves. It had an enormous impact on science, because all of a sudden um, you could illustrate uh, scientific objects, a plant, a botanical plant, which was you know, the pharmaceutical industry of the day. You had to know what were the the plants and the medical properties of the plants, to recognize the plants, how to collect them, etc. Now, um, you had all of a sudden a, a very good illustration of a plant, and you knew you could compare what you saw on the picture here with the plant you saw out there, and you knew you could collect it. So it helped in science also the illustrations of um, you know, uh, scientific instrumentation of enormous importance that you knew how to rebuild a scientific instrument that worked in Leiden. You could rebuild it in Bologna or vice versa. And all this was done on paper and distributed by paper. So <clears throat> this is behind this metaphor, an agent of change. We have to see the many agents but coming together in this kind of configuration. Now, <clears throat> uh, collective agency, of course, also has to do um, with <clears throat> social movements. And um, we, know, we, know, we know something uh, from a historical point of view. Um, industrialization brought with it um, the, the problem of how can you safeguard uh, the health and safety of workers working with the machines that were the basics for industrialization. And um, slowly, slowly, you know, the social movement, labor conflicts, et cetera, people started to stand up for their rights uh, that the workers should not be killed by the machine. And uh, so we had a social movement, the labor movement, that was campaigning for um, better safety measures. And eventually, we had the welfare state with insurance, et cetera, that we take for granted now, at least in the more developed parts of the world. We know this is not the case in every part of, of uh, the world. And we still know that much needs to be done. But th these are the kind of social movements. And then you have the environmental movement that uh, started uh, in the 70s, partly connected with the anti-nuclear movement, uh, etc. And, uh, and so it goes on. And uh, what happens today on uh, university campuses you know, has some aspects of becoming a social movement. We don't know where the social movement would go, what will happen to it. But this is how social movements start, and there is some kind of collective agency involved. So the questions of you know, where, do they where does co collective agency emerge? With people, with ideas, with an infrastructure, with resources that you need, and how to put it together. But this is an empirical question. You cannot abstract from that more than saying, you know, what is the idea? What are the peoples involved? What are the resources you need? You have to put them together as a dynamical process. So it's an empirical process. Sorry, yes? Um, so, I mean, in all these examples, it looks like uh, um, the, I mean, collective agency is always possible. 
circumstances in which individuals follow their uh, um, uh, incentives. In the sense that it is in the best interest of everybody to do what they do, and then uh, you get this collective uh, outcome. Now, other examples where instead, uh, or historical examples where instead uh, people accept uh, against their uh, personal benefit or their personal interest <coughs> to do something for the collective. Well, I mean, in a sense, can individual incentives be thought as a limit to collective efforts? I would say most likely yes, but I focus, you know, not on incentives. I focus on what is the problem. You know, what is the problem that people perceive that people recognize and that people, for whatever reason, are taking responsibility and they feel, I should work on this problem and help to solve it. That's my approach. And so the incentives may vary and the collectives will vary and the relationship between individual, but you know, unless you come to an understanding, we have a problem. And no individual can solve this problem alone. You will not get collective action. That's that's my take on it. So yes, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I mean, so because I mean, if you think that uh, a climate change, uh, so uh, the type of measures we should mm -hmm. uh, really uh, put in, our, in place yeah. to solve it, this would mean that our style of life. Uh, Let's get into this later, yes, <laughs> Sorry. because otherwise it, it, um, it, it detracts um, uh, a, a bit because then we become, uh, <clears throat> if, if, if it is all right with you or you want to discuss this now, because now I, I would like to move to, to, to the second part. Yeah, is it okay? Okay, so <clears throat> this was what I had to say. <clears throat> about collective agency not knowing what it is. Now, let me tell you about <clears throat> a very <clears throat> empirical project that I'm engaged with right now, with Mirta, with Stefan Turner, with Sadi Lalou in, in Paris. And <clears throat> we call it the, the socioscope. Now, <clears throat> what is the socioscope? The socioscope, we call it, it is a new, it's, it's an instrument. And the, the name is taken deliberately, like having a microscope, we, have a, we want to build a socioscope that lets us look into what is happening in <clears throat> society. And <clears throat> in particular, we want to link micro-initiatives, <clears throat> micro-initiatives at the local level that are somehow related with a systemic transition that happens at the Mercosur, and we choose food as an example. And of course, it has to do with sustainability. But <clears throat> we hope if it, if it works, if it uh, evolves and develops, in principle, you could use it also for other domains. You could use it for health uh, prevention, you can use it for energy uh, questions, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, food is something that we all can relate to, <clears throat> that is very closely related to um, <clears throat> sustainability, food security, but also a more healthy living. It has a cultural dimension and, and, and so on. Now, <clears throat> What, <clears throat> yeah, let me just uh, go back here on the left, how it started. That, that's always very interesting for me. <clears throat> uh, how do projects get started? And um, on, the <clears throat> on the left side here, you see <clears throat> a reference to something that preceded the socioscope. And we had uh, what we called the World Research Network. <clears throat> Uh, and this was during the pandemic, <clears throat> uh, the, the Institut des Etudes Avancées uh, in, in Paris, and I was involved in it. <clears throat> we decided <clears throat> there is a lot of 
exchange of ideas about projects that have to do with virology, epidemiology. And there's relatively little uh, social science projects that are related to the pandemic. What's the impact, but also, you know, the kind of connections, <clears throat> transmissions, and so on. So we set, <clears throat> we set up this, um, net, this platform for social science projects around the world. We, we were very keen in involving the so-called Global South. And it was taken up, <clears throat> to our amazement, by lots of people at the height of the <clears throat> uh, use of the, this platform. We had 1,000 projects of social science uh, projects related to COVID, and people started to exchange with each other. So a project done, I don't know, in, <clears throat> uh, in, in you know, Chile, you know, was relating to someone um, in South Africa and, and so on. So people choose <clears throat> with whom they wanted to communicate. So this was fine. And then the pandemic was over and we said, well, we have this platform. We put quite a bit of effort into it. What can we do with it? And we were very naive <clears throat> because we thought people during the pandemic were very keen to use it because communication had broken down so you could exchange there was relatively there was also curiosity and you know wanting to know you know what do other people know and so on but once the pandemic was over <clears throat> you know people were not interested um, uh, of, so so we wanted to use the same platform with the same method for wanting to know what are local initiatives towards more sustainable food in consumption, in production, in transportation. And we failed miserably because people did not want to put anything online. Then we thought, uh, well, maybe if we, uh, you know, we, we look at websites uh, that uh, these local initiatives have and, you know, we sort of play it back to them and say, all you have to do is to press a button and to say you are in agreement. Again, you know, the take-up was very, very low. And then <clears throat> uh, I happened to be at the business school in, in St. Gallen at a, at a seminar, and uh, I mentioned this, and someone in the audience said, have you tried video? And I said, no, we have not tried video. But it stuck in my mind, and I can tell you, video is the magic key for this kind of work. And the same people <clears throat> that said, sorry, we find it interesting, we don't have the time to press the button. Yeah? If we approached them and said, you know, we want to come and make a video with you, and so on, they said, well, when, when would you like to come? <laughs> so we were received with open arms. Of course, you know, we had to announce and uh, explain, etc. but we were received with open arms. And so this is a very important part of the socioscope. We work with video. Now, in the course of time, you know, we changed the way how we work, but we are still, because we believe in a sort of gift economy as something that, you know, people can relate to. You give something, I give something back. So we said to everyone who spends time with us <clears throat> and answering questions, showing us around, we said, um, as, a, as a thank you, we will give you a four-minute video, which we edited, and people were very grateful, and now they put it on their website. But it was also you know, a way of <clears throat> showing uh, a very human gesture of saying uh, thank you. So video is now part of the sources. Now, what are we doing? We are collecting thick Data. This is a, a term that Clifford Gertz, a famous anthropologist, has used. Thick data from, <clears throat> what we call them actors on the ground, from local initiatives. Now, these are not the individuals that we are interested in. We skip the individual level and we move to initiatives. There are already some groups. And I've learned from the poster sessions, uh, a special group is called Affinity Group. I don't know whether we have affinity groups, but you know, there are already people who work together 
and we call them local initiatives. Whatever brought them together, they are <coughs> and, and local. But, <clears throat> and this is an important but that is very uh, logistically challenging, we follow a very strict protocol because we insist on the highest quality of data in order to make it comparable and scalable. In comparison, you can only reach if you follow a strict protocol in the way how you collect your data. So we train interviewers through videos because we discovered each interviewer, when you give them the most detailed instruction, which questions you should follow, they interpret it in a different way. So with a video, they see how a good interviewer does it, and they follow the example. It's part of how the human brain works in imitating. You know, it's not by reading things, it's by seeing things done that we learn and that we imitate and that we are able to follow better than if we just read something and recreate it in our own mind. So this <clears throat> has taken a lot of time for us to come up with this protocol. But now we have the protocol, and it is a semi-structured um, interview, but the difficulty is to get the interviewers to um, understand what is a semi-structured interview. And I just can tell you, we, had, um, uh, we started in France. We had um, <clears throat> young people, some of them with a PhD, and they failed miserably in following uh, semi-structured interviews because they thought, you know, I have a PhD, I know better. So um, in a way, you know, we, we had to stay away of this kind of competence and really find people who are willing to follow what we give them, what we ask them to do. And it's similar to a, to a you know, clinical trial where you have to go stepwise, stepwise, uh, by stepwise. Now, <clears throat> what we want um, is to make this comparable. Um, we are not staying in, in Europe. We have um, contacts now in, in Colombia, in Latin America. We want to expand there. We have South Africa. We also want to include um, some Asian countries. And <clears throat> we are trying to identify clusters. Now, what is a cluster? These local initiatives are more than case studies. We have lots of studies of, about cases. The problem is you cannot compare the cases. They are in different locations, at different times, different organizations. So what we try <clears throat> is to, um, to compare really these initiatives but how are they embedded in the larger context? And I just want to give you here two um, examples. You, you cannot see very uh, closely, it does not matter. But I just want to tell you, this is one example. This was a McDonald's in the south of France that uh, was closed, or was going to be closed, and the employees said, we will take over. <clears throat> So we will, um, you know, it will no longer be a McDonald's uh, in, in, in the old time, but we will take over and we feel a certain responsibility also to the local uh, community around us. So one part means we keep the same providers and we sort of run a restaurant, we, we slightly change, but the other part is we, do, we use extra waste or uh, food that would otherwise become waste, and we turn it into a product that we give for free to the local community. So this is the kind of um, you know, local initiative that we found. And the embedding in the larger environment is you keep the providers, and some give it for free, for others you have to pay, others you know, say, we want to expand, and there's a certain dynamic in it. Uh, the other one is um, <clears throat> in, in, in the Veneto, um, <clears throat> uh, and it's a so-called um, social, <clears throat> social farm, uh, because uh, they, <clears throat> they employ um, disabled youngsters 
who are learning uh, to work the land and to produce food. And they get some money from the regional government because they fulfill an educational purpose. Now, this is an interesting cluster because here we could identify <coughs> the founder. This was set up some 12 years ago, has been going since, and they do not want to grow. That's also an interesting finding. They say we are fine. But they also exchange in various ways. We're interested in, you know, what are the kind of exchanges uh, that happen. So sometimes they, they exchange. Um, so you have different uh, of these local producers in, in the region, but they're all connected. And the founder comes once or twice a year with what he calls uh, an itinerant school and, um, you know, they discuss in a seminar, you know, what is new, and then they cook together, and they drink together, and this is sort of something that holds them together also. So <clears throat> just the embedding in, in, the, in the environment is, is very important. So what have we learned so far? We want to find uh, local initiatives, as I said, all over the world, so we need criteria. What is a local initiative that is of interest for us. So it has to be, there has to be some kind of vision, you know. It's not just business as usual. I do bio uh, production like everyone does bio production now. There needs to be some kind of vision. It has to be relevant in the sense that people have, um, you know, some kind of philosophy, some kind of idea. I want to make the world better. But what is interesting, they speak about their world, how they see their world. And we want to know how they want to make better their world, not the world, but their world. Then <clears throat> exemplarity, <clears throat> it has to be something innovative that has not been done many times uh, before. It has to have some potential for robustness because there are many initiatives, you know, that <clears throat> just flare up, very short-lived. It's, it's local, 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 and then they just disappear. So we want some duration because after two years we want to go back and uh, do interviews again with, uh, with a subsample. And the embeddedness, what are the links to the larger environment? So, of course, great variety. Um, and, for instance, embeddedness in larger context, we found that the relationship to the local municipality is often very important, or the regional government, as in the, in the case of the Concador in, in, in Veneto. And we could identify that within the regional government or the municipality, you need what we call a confederate. You need a person there or a group of persons who understand and who are willing to support you. So it's an interesting link, you know, how you can be embedded to the outside. And, <clears throat> of course, um, all these initiatives are multi-activity. So you do not just grow and, and, and sell, you are engaged in various other kinds. And typically you have hybrid socioeconomic models. You have something where you pay, where you follow, but I can only tell you in the economic literature, this does not exist. You know, it's, a, it's a blank space for, for economists, these kind of hybrid um, you know, uh, models that are uh, emerging. And then um, this is something that so far came out that I find quite interesting to focus on transactions because how can we capture the relationship with the environment? It's through transactions. You give something, I get something. Of course, money is important, but why is money given? So what is the perspective from those that fund the activity? But what we also discovered is an interesting asymmetry. So if A <clears throat> perceives what A gives to B, this is not necessarily what B perceives that B receives from A. 
And this is a very interesting finding that we have to follow up and uh, you know, <clears throat> want to see. And this is also where, of course, the quantitative side comes in. Because what I have been telling you is what we can do on getting very good qualitative data, but get data in a form that is uh, comparable, that is possible to scale up. And then, of course, we are expecting, for instance, in, in this case, if we have these uh, asymmetrical transactions, you know, what does emerge? And this is where um, AI comes in and will help us uh, finding out more. So <clears throat> what the socioscope allows us to do, hopefully scaling up, we want to go up to 600 initiatives all over the world, which is a very ambitious uh, goal. It has to do with sustainability across continents, but <clears throat> sort of the deeper, if you want, theoretical reason is there is a huge gap between micro and macro. And I saw that you have inserted, uh, Matteo inserted uh, this morning, the meso. But the meso, from my perspective, is a big gap. And uh, the, in, in the social sciences, it's different for, uh, for, for the life sciences. You have much better understanding how genes are regulated and so on, which we miss in the social sciences, not to speak about physics. And <clears throat> uh, the best example is if you think of economics, uh, economists think they are the forefront of the social sciences or they are natural sciences. And, uh, you know, econom economics, you have macroeconomics, you have microeconomics, and you have a gap in the middle. And we don't know what happens in the middle. We know something from the micro level moves up to the macro level, changes in the process. There are mechanisms that have to do with institutions, with laws, with regulations with limitations of various kinds, but we don't know what it is. So this is what we want to find out. This is what is driving science. You want to find out something. And this is, of course, the question about transition. So <clears throat> let me come. There's still time, I hope. Yes? Yes, OK. Let me come to the last part, which, again, is you know, shifting uh, completely the perspective but I thought it would uh, perhaps be an interesting example of a uh, collective agency at work, and it worked. Now, <clears throat> this is my very personal experience uh, <clears throat> with, with the ERC, and <clears throat> uh, it starts with going back, I mean, all these <clears throat> apparently new things, usually when you dig a bit deeper, always find a long historical stretch of efforts that went before. And scientists <clears throat> here in Italy, it was already Spinelli and Ruberti and others who started to lob for <clears throat> the idea of an ERC. In Sweden, there were people all over Europe, scientists said, you know, we need some kind of funding for fundamental research and being in the EU, we want it from the EU. But then, and, and this is very sobering for scientists, because usually we think if we know what is needed, it will happen. But it does not happen. And so, you know, politicians did not take notice of it, and the EU <clears throat> foresaw nothing for funding for fundamental science. The EU treaties were very clear. We fund, when we speak about research, we fund research that will make European economy more competitive. That's written in the treaties. And everyone signed up to that. So no way to fund. Now, the life sciences somehow got in through the back door because they said you cannot separate really fundamental from applied, it does not work for us. So they were able to get a bit of funding <clears throat> already in, in, in those days. 
but it was obvious uh, to everyone this cannot go on forever. And then, <clears throat> uh, this is like the Confederates that I mentioned before, the Nordic countries came in. And the Nordic countries realized that their national budgets for fundamental research, meaning research to the universities, were decreasing. And they said, if this goes on, you know, our universities will become poorer and poorer, and there will be less and less fundamental research being done, while, you know, industry <clears throat> will take over, etc. So something needs to be done. And they came up with the idea, we want to revert the relationship. Instead of leaving fundamental research to be funded only by member states, only by national ministries, and national finance ministers. We want the EU to fund basic research. So that was a clear political goal, and it was started by the three Nordic countries. And um, then there were all kinds of conferences and lobbying efforts. Uh, there was the initiative of Science for Europe, and there were national uh, lobbying activities. Then there was finally a big uh, EU conference. Can a European Research uh, Council be possible? Question mark. And <clears throat> there it gathered momentum, but the question mark showed you know, how <clears throat> much hesitation there was. And um, what helped, of course, was the timing. And that's another important dimension when we discuss collective agency. Keep timing in mind. And what helped uh, <clears throat> those of us who were campaigning and lobbying for the ESC was that the seventh framework program was to begin in 2007. For those of you who don't know, we have the framework programs in Europe that usually last seven years. It's a long process. We now dis started already discussing the next fr framework program that begins in, uh, in 28. Uh, <clears throat> so it's a long process, but then you know you have funding for seven years. And so everyone knew if we are missing this date, you know, it will be over for, for our lifetime. <laughs> uh, but if we get in, to the right, in the right moment, then we can make it. And personally, I was at that time chairing the European Research Advisory Board, which was an interesting gathering of uh, 45 people. Um, half of them came from industry, and half of them came from academia. And the 45th person was me as a chair. So in case of a split of vote, uh, I, could, uh, I could decide. So when I moved in, I said, look, um, they were holding separate meetings before. I said, I want nothing of this. Either we are able to get our act together and speak with one voice, or you know, we are just a discussion club. And one of the recommendations that we came up with was we needed fresh money. We have to start with at least 1 billion euro. And, this, and below it, it's not worth starting. So we were very clear on that, and that had an impact on the Commission side. Um, but then <clears throat> were the member states. And there were two member states that were opposed until the very end. Guess who? It was the UK, and it was Germany. Why? <clears throat> because they said, whatever happens in Brussels can never be done as well as we do at home. <laughs> so we oppose this because it will be Brussels. And then we were able, <clears throat> um, with various um, <clears throat> interesting uh, small stories, to overcome this. And uh, in 2006, the year before, <clears throat> you know, all the documents were, were, were set. And th the Commission did not realize how radical they were because they left uh, the setting up of the ERC, setting the strategy to a group of 22 scientists, this ERC Scientific Council. 
And they thought, well, you know, <clears throat> Uh, it, it was a very uh, long process of selecting these. There were 400 applications and proposals, and there was a committee of five who were able to s select these 22 persons, and we really felt like pioneers, and we knew we had only one chance to make it work, or it would fail. But the commission thought, well, you know, these 22, we had two Nobel laureates among the 22, uh, these are all very busy people, they will lose interest, and you know, then we will take over. But this did not happen. And we had a very short window of opportunity, and in the, we, we very quickly came together and said we want to devote two-thirds of the funding for young people, and only one-third for established people. We want to set up the rules according to how we think, you know, an evaluation should function. It's scientific excellence only, no other criteria. Not because you come from Greece or Portugal, you get something extra, etc. And <clears throat> we knew that we had to find the best um, uh, members for our panels. We set up 25 panels. It was never a discussion whether to include the social science and humanities or not. This was taken for granted in the sense of the old 19th century term Wissenschaft, which also you know, is still alive in other languages, in Dutch and in Swedish and so on. You speak about Wissenschaft. And Wissenschaft includes the social sciences and the humanities, and Scienza also in, 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 in Italy. So uh, this, um, but I remember the first week, each one of us was on the phone for one week trying to get the best people to serve uh, in the panels that we could find. But the discussion always went the same. Um, well, hello, how are you, etc. cetera. Uh, Brussels? No, I want nothing to do with Brussels. <laughs> you know, it's bureaucracy. I want nothing to do with it. We said, well, wait, this is new. You have not heard of it as yet. Let me explain. You know? And so we were able to convince <clears throat> the people who we thought um, would really be able to follow the spirit of what we were trying to do, namely to have excellent science in Europe. And, of course, it changed the rules of the competition before if you were the best physicist in Italy, you were the best physicist in Italy. But now you had to compete at European level. And <clears throat> this made a lot of difference because the pool was larger and um, we were very, very adamant about the rules of being transparent and fair in the way how uh, money was, was allocated. So the rest is history. But um, what I would uh, sort of take out of this personal experience, I would say what mattered looking back was <clears throat> the, um, no, sorry, um, <clears throat> the idea, the uh, ESC was an idea whose time was, had come. You know, there is a certain maturation process of an idea or if you want, of how to solve a problem. There's a maturation phase for the solution of your problem. And if you are too early <clears throat> or too late, you miss, and I come back again to this dimension of time and, and timing, which is very important. And we got it, we got it right. And the other one is you had to find allies. <clears throat> and for instance, in my uh, European Research Advisory Board, I got industry on board. And industry was behind it and said, yes, we need fundamental research. And even if it cuts a bit into our budget, we need fundamental research, and we are for it. So you need to find these allies in order to be successful. Now, <clears throat> maybe <clears throat> the time has come for your discussion, collective agency, and how to take it further. I think there is a chance <clears throat> And this is what we try with the socioscope. A chance to connect the best qualitative data that you can find and connect it with the best quantitative means that are now at our disposal. 
And for the socioscope, I mean, we can do video to text and uh, text and, and, and so on, but we can also use the kind of work that <clears throat> Mirta stands for, you know, to, to work with these data. And uh, perhaps this will help us to bridge the gap between micro and macro level and find out what is happening uh, at this meso level. Now, <clears throat> a Freeman Dyson, a physicist, the physicist Snow, I like this quote uh, of him very much. The effect of a concept-driven revolution is to explain old things in new ways. That's what concepts do. The effect of a tool-driven revolution is to discover new things that have to be explained. So with this, I thank you. And those of you who are interested, this is the last book I, <clears throat> I published, and it has been translated with different covers in these languages. Thank you very much. especially as we think of how do we model this wonderful real world. And so uh, Henrik and Matteo were talking about micro, meso, and macro levels. And I was wondering, when you think about socioscope and ERC, let's say, together, do you see some uh, similarities, maybe any parallels between what are some kind of main obstacles on these different levels, on the micro, meso, macro levels, when it comes to organizing a food initiative or organizing an international scientific organization. So, for example, on the individual level, you mentioned how important <coughs> it is to recognize the problem, define it, to take ownership. And that, <coughs> to me, uh, I started thinking about belief dynamics models and how do actually beliefs about what is important spreads in a society. Then on the meso level, you were mentioning importance of uh, local connections, for example, connections of farmers with the local government, or the connections in the scientific community between different parts that are lobbying together. And on the macro level, there are obviously like various legal economic institutions. What do you see? Do you see some such parallels uh, on these let, different levels? Let me, <clears throat> let me clarify. Problems are problems at each level. Problems are not just problems at the micro level. <clears throat> the kind of awareness changes. <clears throat> the way how you can solve a problem changes. What you can do at the micro level is you <clears throat> can differentiate <clears throat> your waste, but <clears throat> you know at the macro level you need incinerators and, and, and so on. Yeah? So <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> maybe I was not clear enough, but <clears throat> it's, it's good that you raised this. <clears throat> Problem awareness, what I said about problem awareness, problem, uh, <clears throat> you know, definition, ownership, having a, a joint problem <clears throat> uh, conception somehow is to be found at every level, but it is a different one at, at every level. Now, <clears throat> the obstacles are all over. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you have obstacles <clears throat> at, the, at the micro level. <clears throat> I mean... The most important one are, of course, uh, lack of resources for these uh, socioscope initiatives. If <clears throat> the resources they get from, <clears throat> because you need some kind of uh, financial input, if this is no longer there, you, you have a problem. What they do, however, is interesting because they start to spread risks. So I would say the strategy of how to deal with it differs. Maybe risk is spread also at other levels, but uh, you know, I can only say <clears throat> what we observe at the micro level is an interesting way of coping. If <clears throat> your resources become less, you start to spread risks. And how you spread it, again, it's an empirical question. And we, we will find out different, uh, great variety of, of it. Now, <clears throat> at the meso level, <clears throat> you are already at the where, where politics enters quite massively. Yeah? You have a different mayor <coughs> in a municipality, <coughs> or you have a you know political change. The new mayor says, you know, I I I don't believe in climate change. I don't care about this, or you know, uh, something else. You you have another problem <coughs> also at, at the meso scale, 
And at the macro scale, we have the problem that we all know and that Matteo, you know, touched when, when, when he spoke. You know, how can we convince the world? You know, our politicians. How can we convince the European Union, but also the U.S. and and so on? Yeah. And <clears throat> again, you have the political dimension. I mean, <clears throat> now we are discussing in Europe and the U.S to raise uh, duties on electric vehicles from China because they will wipe out electric vehicle uh, production <clears throat> there. But at the same time, you know, we want electric vehicles. So you have a <clears throat> typical political problem where you have conflicting interests because you want to <clears throat> protect, and you have as a politician, uh, you know, President Biden, uh, he has to protect the American industry. So <clears throat> what you do? So this, these are the kind of obstacles that change, mm -hmm. but they are, they are all over. Mm -hmm. <coughs> excellent. Thank you. And for clarification about the problem <clears throat> awareness, yeah. and that's, yeah. that's excellent. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And one uh, other thing. Um, if, let's say that we want to change an existing system, and you changed <laughs> various scientific <laughs> systems. What, what would be, is there any generalization about what are the leverage points at these different levels? If you want to change a scientific funding system to be more international and to find excellence rather than networks, do you start from a few <clears throat> individuals? What's the role of individuals? What's the role of, you said the role of timing? Is this timing that, is it necessary that a few individuals lead this until the institutions change that they can feed back in more in getting more individuals involved? Do you have an intuition about that? Uh, well, you know, this is again my, my very personal experience. I really think, uh, you know, it starts with a few individuals. But these few individuals need to have a vision. <clears throat> they need to be able to think ahead. It's a, it's a long-term vision they need. And then you have to be able to, to organize support, to, to, to have a strategy. <clears throat> you know, what are the next steps you want to take? There is no recipe for success. So they need to have resources and persistence in a way to... Uh, you know, I, I think if you have a, <clears throat> a good idea in the sense of having a, a goal <clears throat> that you want to reach, and if you have good people, money will follow. I would not start with resources. I would start with people and with ideas. Thank you. But, you know, there is no recipe for success. The outcome is uncertain, but timing is important because you may, be, you may have the right idea, and yet, you know, if we say the time is not right, what do we mean by it? we mean that the kind of alignments <clears throat> in the configuration of the larger environment mm -hmm. are not there as yet. And this kind of alignment you will need. I mean, in physics you can model this, but for the social sciences <clears throat> it's very difficult. You know, how do you capture an alignment? Huh. Uh, but yeah. <clears throat> uh, this is why I spoke about alliances. Alliances means you align, and then you go in the same direction. You move in the same direction. Even if, uh, you know, you will always have people who say, no, this is wrong, and so on. But you, you start to create a kind of flow mm -hmm. moving in, in the same direction. To translate into modeling efforts, it would be always think of different time scales on which different processes occur, and they need yeah. to, at some point, coincide for the change. That's <coughs> great. So uh, we were asked to kind of provide a little bit of commentary and maybe yeah. start the question. So that's what I'll, I'll try to do. It's a bit impromptu that uh, Nita asked me to join, so I'll try. So first, I think I was very inspired by your talk. Thank you, Helga, for, uh, I, I think, for a mixture of reflection analytics in your first part and then in, in the second and third in trial, how to bring it to practice, but also a certain inspiration of how things were done, things that were very important to us, particularly in DRC. Um, I, I think my first comment, just zooming a little bit out, but I'll, I'll come back to your points, is that I, I like to call it the fish problem, and I think the fish problem is, is, is adequate because first I'm Portuguese and we're in Trieste, so we like fish. 
Um, but it's the following. It comes from media studies and speaks of, you know, one way to say it is, from Marshall McLuhan, is like, does the fish know it's wet? And, and the fish is not supposed to know it is wet. It's just the fish. But in some sense, humans are social. And we are always doing collective agents. We're doing it right now, all the time, right? And it's kind of like, it's so, uh, it, 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 so natural in some sense that we don't appreciate how it works, right? It's particularly difficult to appreciate how it works because it's always present and, and in our lives. And so I think it takes, it takes a special exercise of kind of abstraction and then coming back. So I, I was seeing how you were doing it and I was really appreciating it. You were sometimes were close and sometimes you were far away, right? And you're trying to, uh, to kind of use that, um, Pers that exercise yeah. in perspective in terms to, uh, of giving us insight. So I think that that's important, that sometimes we, we just kind of jump too quickly or we think the problem has certain characteristics. It's just too close to us. Um, so on that, I wanted to maybe challenge, maybe just, just as a provocation, put on the table that uh, you said just that in response to Mirta, and Mirta was asking some of these elements about there being no recipe. Mm -hmm. I, I know there's <laughs> no recipe mm -hmm. in some strict sense. But you also said a bunch of things that s seem to recur. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that in order for... So first, I think, the fa why do people do collective agency? Because, as you said, we can, in principle, solve problems or address issues that we could not do individually. So there's a promise of a big prize, a big satisfaction at the end. I think that that's very important. But that needs to be manifested, right? So there has to be this first exercise of collective vision. What's the problem? Where could we go if we acted together, right? What kind of world or solution or uh, would, would we be in? And I think this is very important. It's always future-oriented, right? It's yeah. typically about something we, we can only imagine at first. So this is very tricky, right? Because it asks people to take a leap of faith. Uh, so, so how do you do that? It's sort of somewhat in the space of information, of creating a narrative, a future vision, of how the work could work, uh, how the world could work, how, right? So that's one. That's yeah. sort of collective mm. imagination. Then I think you need collective mechanism. How do we get yeah. there? Do we mm. feel we can do it? Do we feel we have a path? And this, you talk this also in terms of maturation, perhaps, how the time mm -hmm. has come that we kind of know how mm -hmm. to do it now, the resources and the idea are aligning. It's more mechanistic, but I think without that piece, mm -hmm. the imagination is often not tangible enough to move people or most mm -hmm. people. It seems like then you need that opening. And then I think something that maybe didn't come up enough, but I think in many problems of collective agency is very important, is suppose we can succeed. It will take a long time, typically. But apart from that, there's the issue of reward, of who gets the benefit from what happens. And I think in collective agency problems, this is particularly difficult, because either fame yeah. or money <laughs> is often not yeah. flowing back in there's a problem of fairness, if you want, collective yeah. fairness. But whatever that is, you know, the problem of distribution is very, very tricky. And I think people need to embark on these problems. I, well, it's a question. But having all these elements at least in play in a way that they can imagine that it's, there's a big idea or a worthwhile, that there's a way, and that if it happens, it's going to be fair. <laughs> okay. And so I wonder if that's a bit of a recipe. I ask you to comment, and then if others, and how do we model this, right? I think we could imagine how we could model it, but, but you know, I'll leave it to the audience to then sort of discuss. Let me translate your questions into an image, yes? And the image is we are hunters, and we need to hunt together uh, because otherwise we have no food, yes? So <clears throat> the problem is not only the vision and the imagination of the wonderful meal you want to get, it's also an internal drive, because you know otherwise you will go hungry. And I think the vision connects with the mechanism, because then you discuss, you know, you are a group, and uh, a group has different skills, who is going to attack the animal from this, and what do we have to think about, and is it better we start in the morning, or when they are at the water hole, or whatever. So all this is part of your mechanism, but the mechanism is not separate from your vision. And the vision is never the head alone. We have a body, and very often we forget our bodies. 
And the bodies are important in the world. The more artificial intelligence and virtual <coughs> reality we have, the more we will discover how important our bodies are. Now, <clears throat> I have not <coughs> gone into the third part at all. <coughs> I recognize it's important. But let me stay with the image. So the group <coughs> of hunters comes, comes back home, uh, <coughs> and they have to pray, and they have to prepare. And then, for some reason, I mean, the question, who gets the best piece? So you need to discuss who gets the best piece. But this is how norms arise. And this is something that every collective group that wants to act more than once, I think this is the difference, like in game theory. Yeah? If you play a game once, who cares? But if you want to repeat and be successful also the day after, if you go out for hunting, you better give the best piece to, to whom? You need to discuss. Yeah? And the answers can differ. But if you are unfair, <clears throat> the ones who are treated unfair at one point will revolt. And they will either sabotage or they will go out on their own and uh, you know, or kill the other ones. And uh, there are various solutions to it. But I think it's an important part, but I would put it into the, um, the evolution of norms. And Simon has been working on this for a long time, as you know. <laughs> Mm. So I'm happy to carry you. Uh, you and thank you, Louis, for improvising. In, in what? I, I did not understand the word. What happened at the meso? Uh, at the meso, yeah. yeah. And I, I would like to give you two examples. Mm -hmm. I mean, one is the ERC, yeah. because I was part of the panel yeah. during, under your command. Mm -hmm. OK. <laughs> and, and it was interesting uh, to realize this. And the concept here is that you need to stabilize narratives Oh, finally. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I was shouting a little bit. Um, and, and the second example is, is the, I'm going to bring the Andes, the Andes region in South America. And there's an Andean tradition, um, which is really interesting. It's called, uh, people, I mean, the ethnographers and anthropologists call it the Andean reciprocity. You know, it's something that little communities all across the Andes do. It has different names, but they organize themselves uh, such that they do communal work once, twice, or three times a year uh, regarding cleaning up the water channels. Uh, 
and uh, also regarding uh, moving things. And one of the traditions in, in Chiloé Island is to move a house. If you want to, people usually move houses. So the whole community moved the house with oxen and, and carts and things. It's really fantastic. And the other thing is that when you, you come of age in a, in, a, in a community, you pay a party for the saint. And you is a way you pay mm -hmm. to the community what the community has given you. Mm -hmm. So, and, mm -hmm. and I think that those traditions, which are inspiring norms of behavior, uh, keep the agency alive and keep it stabilized so it can keep functioning through time. Because you keep solving the same problems that are recurring, water yeah. moving around and, and cleaning you know, the channels and all that stuff. So I, I, I like that uh, this kind of uh, ideas in terms of how you stabilize yeah. agency. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much for reminding me also of this. Um, you know, the unconscious bias was uh, something that I cared very much about. And then we were discussing, how, what, what can you do? And so we said uh, to, uh, to the um, uh, <clears throat> officer of, of the ERC agency, who were always sitting in there, you know, just make anonymous notes <clears throat> of what you hear where you think an unconscious bias is being uh, pronounced. And so we had a collection, an anonymous collection of what people actually said. And then we used it to make the video. And indeed, you know, people were always taken aback. Somebody said that because, you know, it's unacceptable. And I would never have done it, but people actually did it. Yeah? So, and it's a way of, uh, you know, the link to the socioscope is why we insist so much on this protocol to be followed. It's a form of stabilization. Yeah? Because people tell you different things, but you have to find a way of, uh, doing just what you said so beautifully. I've not used this phrase before, but I will use it in the future. So. And um, yeah, so that's, <clears throat> and, and, and the Andes, this is something that we're at the beginning of the socioscope, but we expect that at one point, um, you know, we will uncover uh, many practices that are ignored by mainstream economics. And reciprocity is one very basic human norm that has existed since ever. <clears throat> and it plays an important role in these local initiatives because what they exchange is you have a horizon, you give something, but you expect something back, when, etc. And this is not captured by market. Um, by the market at all, and uh, but this is something that needs to be, you know, empirically built up, and we will see where, where where we go. But we expect, you know, a lot of things that is just ignored and does not exist, and yet it exists and has something to do with sustainability. And Mirta will help us. <laughs> Thank you very much for this very inspiring talk. And actually, I came into the world of urban complexity science through an ERC grant. I was okay. a postdoc there, so <laughs> thank you very much for the effort. Um, right, so my question relates to the mesoscale level. So um, at the moment, there is a tension between governance and uh, individual agency and how we build up to collective agency. So uh, when we look around how societies are working in, uh, in particular in developing, in developed uh, uh, cities, you see that um, the values are put more into the government and less into the communities. And so people seem to have been losing uh, this sense of responsibility. So the sense of taking the values for collective agency and the well-being of, you know, the people within your society, in your city, in your neighborhood, seems to now, at the individual level, to, to be put into what the government should be doing for the well-being of the individuals. Mm -hmm. So how do we reconcile? And I, and I say this, so I'm coming from Mexico, 
So there is, uh, given that we are not going to receive any help from the government, <laughs> communities and families need to be, you come together in order to help each other. So the values and what happens to the individual, it's first put at the community level and then mm -hmm. at the government level. So how do we reconcile this, um, this gap? And I see this, the mesoscale level, yeah. so to speak. I, I fully agree, this is happening at the mesoscale, and this is why it is so important for the socioscope to move outside of Europe. Because I was in, in January, I was in South Africa, and I was interested, um, I, I was invited by the African Institute of Mathematical Sciences to speak about AI, which for Africa is like falling from the sky. Yeah? And they don't know what to do with it, or so they need it badly, but they need it to answer the needs they have. But then I was also talking with, um, with people because I want to have the socioscope include uh, South Africa, and this is one of the problems that came up. You know, the communities, <clears throat> uh, and there's a certain self-organizational capacity. The potential is there for self-organization. And yet, you know, then you have the, the governance <clears throat> and, and the government at whatever meso level you have. And um, the conflicts are there. So I can only say I fully recognize what you say we will find out you know, how it is handled, and probably we will find different um, instances where you have a, a, government, <clears throat> a government that responds or a government that ignores. And what will follow from that, I don't, I don't know. But you know, it, it is, um, it, it's this widening of, of the perspective which, um, you know, excites me also with, from, the, from the socioscope. I mean, one of the things that is happening in many of the South African townships right now is that you have uh, large supermarkets moving in. Now, in one sense, you can say this is good because, uh, you know, there's greater variety, uh, services, etc. At the same time, it wipes out at least half of the local, uh, <clears throat> you know, food, food of the day, the street food activities, etc. The problem comes in, in addition to that because South Africa, you still have daily power cuts. Yes. Daily power cuts since a couple of years, and this will continue. So whatever you can buy in the supermarket is either junk food, or you have to put it into your, at least the fridge at home. Yes. But if <clears throat> you have power cuts continuously, putting it in a fridge will only, you know, be half as good. So, and yet, uh, having the supermarkets in moving into township has something to do with the <clears throat> government or the, you know, the local authority that says, yes, we promote the supermarkets because you will have better services for the townships and people who need it, etc. The world is full of conflicts. Yes. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Helga. Really, really nice talk and very interesting. Um, it's clear that you have a lot of wisdom to share, so it's quite nice. Um, I just had a couple of comments. So one was about the, 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 the uh, types of reciprocity, right? So I love these, these, these Amish and the Mennonites, you know, who share and build houses as well. That's also cool. And the, um, the hunting example is quite nice. Um, you asked who to share the food with. And one of my favorite stories is from, uh, many of you will have read it already, is from uh, The Weirdest People on Earth, right? So, so Joseph Henrik's book about the Ilahita, right? And the, the Ilahita, they borrow this cultural practice from, called the Tambaran, in which they cannot eat their own pigs, right? They have to share their pigs out. And what's interesting, I think, about this, especially with respect to some of the things you're talking about, is it allows the community size to grow. Because now you take a local structure and you turn it into a more of a small world structure where I'm sharing out resources with people who are a little bit further away from me in the network. And that sort of grows the whole thing, which then leads to my question to you, which is you said that Germany and the UK were against the idea, <laughs> right? And you sort of then sort of swept it aside because I'm guessing it's either one of two things. It's a really complicated explanation 
or it's a very interesting explanation. So how do you take the two individuals that you absolutely need to agree and transform them into allies in this community to create the ERC? Well, for the ERC, the answer is rather simple, <clears throat> but it's only a personal experience. You know, I cannot generalize it. Uh, <clears throat> what, um, what I did, one, uh, my, my vice president <clears throat> was a Scottish physicist <clears throat> whom I uh, immediately sent to speak to Lord Sainsbury, which he did, and Lord Sainsbury uh, was going to speak at a big EU conference, and he came very dramatically and said, this is the speech I have been given, and these are the objections to the ERC, but I have been convinced. <laughs> so this was the UK. Germany was more difficult, <clears throat> but then we found a way, uh, you know, that uh, Mrs. Merkel's husband is, was an active scientist. So we found a way to speak to Merkel's husband, who spoke to Mrs. Merkel. <laughs> And this way, <laughs> the, problem, <laughs> the problem was solved. <laughs> it even has supermarkets in it. Okay. So, uh. Uh, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. Very inspired it. Um, I would like to, 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 to talk about three points. The first one, I mentioned that I am from Colombia, and you say that you have a lot of projects or collaboration in Colombia. I would like to know more about this. At which uh, level do you have the collaboration at local community, industries, uh, collaboration with the universities, or with governments, or how, how do you approach how do have you have <clears throat> approaching this? This is the first one. The second one is that you, when you say that um, you work with people and you try to identify the problems with people, something like that, and to solve the problem, be creative, creative. So it made me think in a, in a project that, that is in Colombia, that is called Gaviotas, I don't know, it's a, it's an international, well-known project. Gaviotas in Spanish mean seagulls, like birds. And it is a project that is in, in the jungle. It's in, um, where the, in the jungle, it is uh, now a little bit less, but in the past it was surrendered by a lot of conflict and guerrilla problems, like conflict. So it was difficult to work there. But a man that is called Paolo Lugari created a fantastic project. And this was, is talk about ecological problems. He, he was going, uh, working with the community and develop uh, infrastructure, a zero emission infrastructure, a zero emission gases, a infrastructure, a, last, a, a one car, zero emission, a water, water solving, what do they? So water supplier for, mm -hmm. uh, for the community because it's difficult to get access to, to the water problem. And, uh, and it's um, made me think in, in the project that maybe you are, they yeah. are doing with yeah. creativity and it's very well known. <laughs> People invite <clears throat> him to talk yeah. about and it's called Engineer Without Borders. And this is the second point. And the third point is that um, you mentioned also creativity. And there is a really good book about uh, creativity that made me think also in your, in your presentation and that is called The Art of Solving Problems from uh, Rosel Akoff. He's, uh, uh, oh, he was, I don't know, I think he, he passed away because he was in the, he has a center at the University of Pennsylvania so a cough, a cough center, probably, probably you know. And the, the book mm, talk about that uh, people need to be teach in how to be creative, creative. So this is really good point because we say we are creative, but if regularly people, community or, or governments, systems at the whole level teach us to be 
constantly creative to solve problems, it will be really great point. Thank no, you. Yeah, no, I, I agree. On, on the first point, I, I can only say, you know, please look uh, at, at the website. And we are in an early phase, but you, you will find what uh, about economy. And second point also, third point, well taken. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are out of time. I, uh, Over Elga. time. Um, do we have? No, we should. We should. You are the master of ceremony. But you are the kind. You're okay. Do, would you like to take one more question and then of we course. go? For, of course. Okay, one more question. <laughs> then we go for lunch. Uh, there will be more. Huh? Photo. Photo. <clears throat> photo. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, thank you for that wonderful talk, and in fact, for the discussion after that. Um, you know, this problem of the meso scale, which you which you mentioned. Um, I just want to share my own perception about what's happening in India, or what has been happening over the decades mm -hmm. in India, there are lots of voluntary organizations at the micro scale, um, you know, whose efforts could possibly, you know, be documented by the yeah. socioscape, who've been working in various different uh, fields, um, with a lot of idealism, with mm. a vision, with, you know, with purpose, and um, doing a lot of very interesting work. But these organizations can never get together. Um, you know, they somehow, even though they share a larger vision about what they want the society to be, they somehow never can come together. And perhaps it is because they disagree on some small things uh, with each other. And um, they can't trust each other or, uh, you know, this question of fairness, which, which Lewis, uh, uh, you know, raised, arises. Um, but the small differences always overshadow um, the cooperation and, you know, the, the larger vision that they share. And um, so, uh, you know, one always wonders, why does this happen? Why can't people who ultimately agree with each other on the broad things not come together because of, uh, you know, small differences? This is, is this a particular problem? Because human beings can only work in groups of a certain size and, you know, beyond that size, it, it, you know, there mm -hmm. is a human yeah. sort of cognitive <laughs> problem or what is it? I don't know. Uh, uh, so I just wanted to share this point. And, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree with the diagnosis. I have no answer except that I will keep thinking of it and uh, I'm sure in the socioscope um, further on we will, we will have to deal with this problem. Because it's not just in India, we see it also, <clears throat> you know, all the um, NGOs at the world scale, you know, uh, <clears throat> once you get uh, to observe what is happening, uh, how much uh, competition there is between them and, you know, not wanting to share, etc. And how much more could be done if they were able to agree. So it's a huge problem everywhere, also in the academic community, I would say. Thank you so much. <laughs> it was great. <laughs>